Hello, horror fans, and welcome back to J vs. Horror. I am your host, J Wall, and today, guys, we're kicking off a new show called Based on a True Story. And of course, there is no better first subject to discuss than The Exorcist. So, what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to take a brief look at the movie, and then we're going to talk about the true story behind The Exorcist. Of course, it's a 1973 American supernatural horror film directed by William Friedkin and produced and written for the screen by William Peter Blatty based on the 1971 novel of the same name by Blatty. The film stars Ellen Bernstein, Max von Sydow, Lee J. Cobb, Kitty Wynn, Jack McCowan, Jason Miller, and Linda Blair. It is the first installment in the Exorcist film series, of course, and follows the demonic possession of a 12-year-old girl named Reagan and her mother's attempt to rescue her through the rite of exorcism conducted by two Roman Catholic priests. Although the book had been a bestseller, Blatty, who produced, and Freakin, whose choice for director, had difficulty casting the film. After turning down or being turned down by some of the biggest stars of that era, at a certain point here, though, Freakin and Blatty decided... They wanted the story to be the star. And so not only did they not choose any of the big name stars, but they went with relatively unknown actors all the way around. And of course, this was vigorously opposed by Warner Brothers Pictures. Principal photography was also difficult with the film. Most of the sets burned down and Blair and Bernstein suffered long-term injuries and accidents. Ultimately, the film took twice as long to shoot as scheduled and cost more than twice its initial budget. The Exorcist was released in 24 theaters in the United States and Canada in late December and audiences flocked to it, waiting in long lines during winter weather, many doing so more than once despite critical reviews that were mixed at best. Some viewers had adverse physical reactions, often fainting or vomiting to scenes in which the protagonist undergoes a massive change in character. Some of the scenes in this movie were known to cause heart attacks, even miscarriages, and a psychiatric journal carried a paper on cinematic neurosis triggered by the film. Many children were taken to see the film, leading to charges that the MPAA ratings board had accommodated Warner Brothers by giving the film an R rating instead of the X rating they thought it deserved in order to ensure its commercial success. Several cities made efforts to ban the film outright or prevent children from seeing it at all. The cultural conversation around the film, which also encompassed its treatment of Roman Catholicism, helped it become the first horror film to be nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture. Alright horror fans, now The Exorcist has always been one of my favorite films. It's one of the only films that I can honestly say ever truly scared me in my life. And it sticks with me to this day in that capacity, even though the reason why I was scared of it when I was a child was because I was a religious person and now I'm not a religious person. I still find the film quite freaky and creepy, I guess I would say. It's also a horror film that just provides a great conversation for its audience. I mean, there is a theological discussion being had here, but at the same time, the film questions itself. There are several times in the movie, if you watch very closely, that things don't exactly make sense. And that's because the film is questioning its own plot line. I think the biggest controversy surrounding the film is probably... Does The Exorcist go too far? That is the question. And in my opinion, yes, it probably does go a little bit too far, but that's kind of also the point. We're showing a child here who is purely innocent being corrupted by something purely demonic. And so, Friedkin wanted to find, you know, what is the most vulgar thing we could have this demon do to prove that it has total control over this child? I mean... The things that the demon does, the masturbation with the crucifix, uh, several other scenes that are pretty hardcore, these things are intended to show us that the possession is real because they're not even concepts or ideas that children would have. In my opinion, guys, The Exorcist is one of those cornerstone films like Psycho that if you take it out of the horror genre, the whole foundation is going to fall apart. It's that important. It's a solid 9.5 out of 10 for me, and it's one of those films that I tell people, if you haven't seen it, what are you doing with your life? Stop what you're doing right now and go watch The Exorcist. And for anyone who's never seen it who says horror films don't scare them, give this one a chance. It's done it for a lot of people. So now let's move on and let's talk about some of the 
true story behind The Exorcist. Now, we know that the novel was written by William Peter Blatty, and he did base this on an actual case, The Exorcism of Roland Doe. In the late 1940s in the United States, priests of the Roman Catholic Church performed a series of exorcisms on an anonymous boy documented under the pseudonym Roland Doe or Robbie Mannheim. The 14-year-old boy was alleged to be a victim of demonic possession, and the events were recorded by the attending priest, Raymond J. Bishop, so subsequently any documentation and all recording of any events having to do with this exorcism were used as elements in William Peter Blatty's story, The Exorcist. In mid-1949, several newspaper articles printed anonymous reports of an alleged possession and exorcism. The source for these reports is thought to be the family's former pastor, Luther Miles Scholes. According to one account, a total of 48 people witnessed this exorcism. Nine of them were Jesuits. According to author Thomas B. Allen, Jesuit priest Father Walter H. Halloran was one of the last surviving eyewitnesses to the true events and participated in the actual exorcism. Allen wrote that a diary kept by attending priest Father Raymond J. Bishop detailed the exorcism performed on Roland, a.k.a. Robbie. Speaking in 2013, Allen emphasized that definitive proof that the boy known only as Robbie was possessed by malevolent spirits is unattainable. According to Allen, Halloran also expressed his skepticism about potential paranormal events before his death. When asked in an interview to make a statement verifying that the boy had actually been demonically possessed, Halloran responded saying, No, I can't go on record. I never made an absolute statement about the things because I didn't feel that I was qualified to do so. Roland Doe was born into a German Lutheran family. During the 1940s, the family lived in Cottage City, Maryland, but then moved to South Africa. According to Allen, Roland was an only child and depended upon adults in his household for playmates, primarily his Aunt Harriet. His aunt, who was a spiritualist, introduced Roland to the Ouija board when he expressed interest in it. Now, according to Thomas B. Allen, after Aunt Harriet's death, the family experienced strange noises, furniture moving on its own accord, and ordinary objects such as vases flying or levitating when the boy was nearby. The family turned to their Lutheran pastor, Luther Miles Scholes, for help. Long interested in parapsychology, Scholes arranged for the boy to spend a night in his home in order to observe him alone. When the parapsychologist, J.B. Ryan, learned that Schultz claimed he witnessed household objects and furniture seemingly moving by themselves, Ryan wondered if Schultz unconsciously exaggerated some of the facts. Schultz advised the boy's parents to see a Catholic priest immediately. According to the traditional story, the boy then underwent a n number of exorcisms. Edward Hughes, a Roman Catholic priest, conducted an exorcism on Roland at Georgetown University Hospital a Jesuit institution. During the exorcism, the boy allegedly slipped one of his hands out of the restraints, broke a bed spring from under the mattress, and used it as an impromptu weapon, slashing the priest's arm and resulting in the exorcism ritual being halted. The family then traveled to St. Louis, Missouri, where Roland's cousin con contacted one of his professors at St. Louis University. From here, two priests from the college church were dispatched to go to the boy's home, where they observed a shaking bed, flying objects, the boy speaking in a guttural voice, and exhibiting an aversion to anything sacred. After this experience, William Bowdrin from the College Church was granted permission from the Archbishop to perform yet another exorcism, and this exorcism took place at the Alexian Brothers Hospital in South St. Louis, Missouri. Before the final exorcism ritual began, another priest, Walter Holleran, was called to the psychiatric wing of the hospital where he was asked to assist Baldrin in the exorcism. William Van Roo, a third Jesuit priest, was also there to assist. Halloran stated that during this scene, words such as evil, hell, and along with other various remarks appeared on the teenager's body like they were being carved into his body. Allegedly, during the litany of the saints portion of the exorcism ritual, the, boy, the boy's mattress began to shake and move. Moreover, Roland broke Halloran's nose during the process. Halloran told a reporter after the rite was over that the anonymous subject of the exorcism went on to lead a rather ordinary life. So, in their words, 
this final ritual of exorcism worked. And, you know, I think one of the big problems here is that we're translating a true story into a book that's based on a true story into a movie that's based on a book that's based on a true story. So we're already three ways removed from the actual truth by the time we get to the movie. And we see here that none of the big antagonistic nasty scenes of The Exorcist were actually true. That was something that was done to create awe visually. In a sense to where people could not believe the amount of evil they were seeing on screen. This is what they perceive to be evil in their minds and they're seeing it in a massive amount visually on screen. Even William Peter Blatty who wrote the book had a problem with the movie in the sense that he said, look, there are certain things that happen in life that are beyond natural. There's a force behind it that makes it supernatural. But then there are also things that just cannot happen, like a young girl's head turning around 360 degrees on her body. That cannot happen and it goes beyond supernatural to a place of unreal. And I always thought that was a very valid idea expressed by the author of the novel. Now, if you want to know more about the true story of The Exorcist, there's another book you can grab. It's from 1993. It's called Possessed, The True Story of an Exorcism. And it was the actual experience of Thomas B. Allen. He offered a consensus of today's experts and also his own experiences and talks about how Robbie was just a deeply disturbed boy and that there was nothing supernatural about the case. So check that one out if you get a chance. And guys, I don't know about you guys, but I enjoy investigating stuff. I was a cop for 12 years, and I like to get to the bottom of it. So that's what we're going to be doing with this series, and we're going to be taking on these classic horror films that say they're based on a true story, and we're going to be checking out the true story to line it up to just see how much of what actually truly did happen is in the damn story in the first place. <laughs> All right, guys, I had fun, and we will talk to you the next time we've got something worth talking about. Bye.